when you look at the, the challenges that we've got coming forward, when you're looking at um, you know increasing drought, floods, conflict, and things, the very kind of fabric of, of life, things like food systems and food availability, they're, they're going to start to become really scarce. And as, as beings, sentient beings, we have a choice either to kind of go down the route of like individualist and like, you know, hoarding and, and you know, not sharing and hatred and uh, division, or we can be compassionate and, and come together and support one another through these challenges ahead. <laughs> Sarah Greenfield Clark is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Sarah is a passionate change maker and advocate for people, power, and radical collaboration. With Liam, she co founded Climate 25 as an evolutionary, not for profit, focused on agility, pace, and systems change. She is committed to lifelong learning and finding new ways to platform the voiceless amidst the climate change, ecological, and human humanitarian crises. Prior to Climate 25, Sarah helped birth Extinction Rebellion with strategy, partnership, and leading fundraising efforts. Sarah completed a distance learning MSC sustainability, achieve, uh, achieving a first in 2018. She has written for Huffington Post and helped coordinate and create green initiatives in her city of Chelmsford. Is that how you say it? Chelmsford, yeah. Chelmsford. Sarah has two kids and in what little spare time she, she has, she's making an eco energy efficient home with her husband using as many secondhand materials she can uh, find and source. Uh, the way we know each other is, is a couple different ways. We have a, uh, a mutual good friend, Laura Stein, of uh, former of TEDx uh, creator and uh, Boma Global. And also, uh, Sarah received the 2018, I believe it was, Climate Reality Leadership Training in Berlin uh, from Al Gore's Climate Reality Project of which uh, many of my listeners know I was the Germany and Austria country manager from Al Gore and uh, one of the first 50 people trained by Al Gore as a climate speaker in his ranch in Carthage, Tennessee. So um, I really appreciate you guys being here and Sarah, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. It's so good for you to be here and, and to take the time to speak with us today. So we came uh, to know each other kind of in a roundabout way, but you've been doing this for, for a while, not only through Al Gore's climate reality training, but also getting into the movement and, and raising awareness. What sparked you to, to make that leap or to, to make that jump into the activism and, and what you do? Um, yeah, it actually feels like it's not been very long since I've been involved in this. I was quite um, late to the party, I guess, in understanding how severe the crises were. Um, and it wasn't until, I think, 2015 that my husband and I watched a documentary, a National Geographic one called um, Before the Flood by Fisher Stevens. Um, and the imagery and story just captivated us firstly, and then <laughs> then just broke me solidly for about a week. I think I was grieving very, very deeply after watching that. Um, we have two kids, uh, as you've, you mentioned in the intro there. And so I have this kind of biological link to the future through them. And I just couldn't, couldn't turn my back on this information. Um, so uh, the, the thing that I tend to do is <laughs> explore and understand an issue like as much as I can and then figure out how best I can apply myself to the solution. So um, as you mentioned, I went back and did a postgrad in sustainability, which was really broad, covered so much it's, uh, from, you know, basic climate science to the human aspect of this political, cultural um, systems thinking, like what we eat, what we how we live, how we, um, you know, how we get from A to B, absolutely everything. 
and that uh, so that I did that did that distance learning. And as that was coming to an end, I I I felt two things. I felt really um, that we have as a, as a species, humanity, we have the solutions, we have the technology, we have the human power, we have the finance. Um, to achieve this transition. But for me, um, the missing piece was the everyday ordinary citizens, the kind of awareness of how severe and how much of an emergency this really was, because I had been in that bubble and just kind of conforming and not really questioning anything. Um, and so I imagined that there were many more people like me. Um, and Extinction Rebellion was forming then, that was 2018. Um, I'm trying to think when the Berlin, the, the Al Gore thing crossed over, I think that would have been in my, uh, my mission to learn as much as possible about this and to figure out how best I could contribute. Uh, it was either 2018 or 2017. My, my memory is fading as well. I think it was 2018. I remember, I remember being so excited. I think that was one of my first steps of like, okay i need to i can be a change maker and i remember like writing in and doing the application and not having like a history of this a background of this at all and fully expecting to be rejected <laughs> i don't know why just because yeah not not kind of really having a background in it and just being so excited when i was accepted and um it was such an intense uh, but really eye-opening few few days um and then, yeah, as I mentioned, then Extinction Rebellion was kind of forming. And I think I'd found that through Facebook groups and messages and things. Didn't really know what that was about. Um, so I went along to the first official kind of launch of Extinction Rebellion um, in October 2018. And just thought, OK, wow, this makes sense to me. Like just stopping people, just hitting pause and like, OK, this is a real issue everybody needs to pay attention and, and be part of the um be part of the story of, for change you know it can't happen without people if we're going to change everything it's going to need everybody um and so yeah there was something there that just really aligned for me I felt like it was a really safe space also to kind of bring in um the emotional burden of knowing this um <clears throat> which is something that's it's being talked about more and more uh, but you know that it's a, it's, a, it's a heavy weight to, to kind of look into the client at uh, the climate science and um, see the kind of predictions that are, <laughs> are being laid out for us and the trajectory we we're on. Um, and so the thing for me that appealed was that regenerative culture piece of Extinction Rebellion, which is accepting all parts of us to come um, and making space for those emotions as well. Um, I I just have to say that it was the 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 passion and the um like the manpower the all the actually woman power as well, <laughs> as well behind that that early group of extinction rebellion um curators i guess like a curate curating us a, a new social movement was just incredible to be amongst and i can't take credit for any of the uh planning from before that point obviously i think it was about two years of, of research and things that went into the making before i joined in that october um, and the mentality was just like, if you see a need, roll your sleeves up, jump in and get, all, you know, get involved, get organized. Um, and so I asked, uh, I met Gail, first of all, and asked where, uh, this is Gail Bradbrook, the, one of the uh, co-founders of Extinction Rebellion, asked her what, what needed doing, and she uh, tasked me with fundraising. <laughs> and I've never, I'd never been a fundraiser before. I'd done like some local things for, for Chelmsford to try and get local initiatives, but nothing on that scale um so i but there was a need so <laughs> so i tried to do i did my best there like convene i did that for about a year and convened a, a kind of team of um volunteers to like figure out all of the different strategies for raising funds for a social movement which we learned so much in that first year um and it was it's a really interesting time 2018 2019 because you had the rise of fridays for future as well I actually met um, Greta in on that October, um, in yeah, in 2018, and to see to see all of these movements evolve and flourish, um, it, was, it was just magical to be a part of it. Really, um, yeah. Have you had any experience of like? Have you been in like? Have you been along to a, an action by either the, the, I, the climate I've been, strike? I've been or? along to uh, Extinction Rebellion and to. 350.org so uh, different movements for them um, obviously 
tons of climate reality trainings, but also some action campaigns, some different marches and protests, all, all, almost um, all the Fridays for Future in, in Davos and in Hamburg, uh, one in Berlin, um, so, <laughs> and, 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 a, and a bunch of others. I've been doing this for, for quite some time. The reason I kind of ask about that intro, so uh, uh, as well as a, a little bit more about you to kind of get that out, but some of that, so not only your degree and sustainability, but also your training from Al Gore and what you've now experienced from that, that kind of, you kind of got into it, you know, right when it was getting hot and heavy and uh, a, a lot of activism and a lot of uh, people um, coming bubbling to the surface now with this awakening, so to say, of, of what's going on and whether they saw a, a documentary, whether they read a book or heard a speech or were motivated through actions of, of community. Um, now, the last 12 months, we've experienced the, the pandemic, the, um, which is all very much tied to, to climate and uh, air quality and environment. And, and uh, we've experienced Black Lives Matters. We've experienced more things around uh, Fridays for Future and even with Extinction Rebellion where it, people are like, what are we, what's going on now? What's this craziness, the inauguration in the United States and the Brexit and all the craziness in the world that's going on. Did, did that, any of that thing set you into a situation where you're like, oh, I want to crawl in a hole and and go to sleep or were you prepared with any of that short experience where you said, boy, it's bubbling to a head. I have the tools. I know what to do. We're going to make it through this and we're going to come out on the other end stronger or even just keep going and we, we, we know what to do. And so basically that question is, is how have you weathered this crazy time? For me, it's still going on. I'm in Hamburg, Germany, and we're now in the the, the next lockdown phase that uh, probably will go, you know, mid-April or more, but uh, that, you know, it's just things aren't going to get back to normal. I don't want them to get back to normal, but uh, how have you weathered it and what are your plans? What have you, what are your learnings during this period? Yeah, I think um, that's a really good question. And I really love how you're, uh, you're connecting all of these what could be seen as disparate kind of issues it like what's going on now it, it's completely interrelated you know when you think of um ecology and how we intensively farm um you know animals and things of course pandemics have been predicted for for a while now and the advice has been there and uh, and we haven't seen that change so of course it's this is the outcome um and again, with you know, Black Lives Matter, you, you see time and time again, communities of, of people of black and brown um, origin, they are, have contributed least to the crises and to the um, destructive ways of living, but they're at the front lines of, those, you know, of the, the, the um, devastating effects of climate breakdown. So at its very core, ecology, ecological balance is about um, justice and is about uh, kind of equity, not just for humans, but for other species, plant species and animals, like everything needs to change. Um, so firstly, love that you're seeing that, um, that parallel. And I think in response to coping mechanisms, for me, um, it's about having people that you can talk to. Um, I remember before I finished my, my master's in sustainability, I used the, um, I don't know what you call it uh, in, in other countries, but there's like a chaplaincy service within the university. So if you're having, if you're struggling with your mental health, you can go and, and seek support. And, um, <laughs> and the person that I went to, it's, it's a really b bizarre kind of backwards thing. So the person you go to, you're going, okay, I'm really struggling like with all of this data and, and the predictions and the trajectory we're on, you know, this isn't, uh, this is very real and this is a very real threat. And I'm, um, concerned about my kids and the um the professional the count like counseling professional hadn't had any experience she didn't have that context that so she she really didn't know how to best support me um she was absolutely fantastic amazing uh, woman and just I was deeply I found value from those sessions in a different way 
Um, but what, what I decided was to try and find more people that felt like me um, and try and find uh, practitioners who were working in this space who could provide the right support. So I set up a um, Facebook group. Um, I think it's called uh, Eco uh, Climate Grief and Eco Anxiety Hub for Concerned Citizens. <laughs> Ridiculous name. I didn't know what to call it. Um, but uh, yeah, I cr created this and just started to kind of see more people come forward, um, really battling with the sadness and the grief and the fear and um, and in doing in, in finding those people that you can talk with very really authentically, you you find like um, I don't know, just find more hope and find. Um, more positivity just having had those conversations and so the same thing can be applied really to you know this isolation period with COVID it's it, finding ways and that's you know digitally connecting through a Facebook group and for all its sins of negativity and hate and for fake news and things it, there's still a place for digital community done right um, in my opinion and uh, that's that's what I've that's the resource that I've leaned heavily on, I think, to, to weather me through the various different kind of uh, highs and lows. Um, yeah, I mean, we created this Climate 2025 completely uh, remotely, digitally. So this was, we're about a year, coming up to a year now. Um, and so it was kind of formed just before COVID really took hold, it was, started to kind of plan for this new not-for-profit um, back in, I think, December. 2019 um and then kind of so so we've never we've never had a place so we've always you know, we've, we've grown quite quickly in this first year from just the the directors and now to about six or seven um employees and then contract researchers and things and so we all convene on on a zoom like this and it's it's quite bizarre having like such a deeply connected authentic communicating team but actually never having met these people in in person um so yeah i think that you know that you can talk to and be real with is the way forward for me can you tell me how you came up with the, the name 2025 what the thinking is behind it what the core function of what 2025 does what they hope to do um think a little bit more about it yeah, I'd love to. Um, I actually can't take credit for the, the naming of it. Um, but for me, we, we'd gone back and forth. For me, what it embodies is the, the kind of drawdown and the, the timescales that we're working with. So it's really easy. We've seen politicians kick these things into the long grass and, and it's really easy to set targets way in the future and think that's somebody else's problem. So for me, um, the climate 2025 means a drawdown of my resources, my energy, my focus, intensively working now, here and now today, because anything that we do, the sooner we do things, <laughs> the better the outcome is going to be uh, on so many levels, like on, on a humanitarian level, but also financially, it's going to cost more to solve these problems later down the line than it is to invest in time and resources now. So for me, um, yeah that 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 means a lot it means that i'm i'm committed to this intensely uh and like i think in a conversation we've had before it's, it's really hard to shut out work like this is a permanent reality and so sometimes i i work you know six seven days a week on this because it needs it it needs it now um so yeah so for me it, it kind of embodies everything that we feel about this urgency and about change now um and not kicking this down down the line for somebody else to deal with um you, you, you don't see it as work <laughs> no uh, no this is really odd and and actually to be to i've never ever had a kind of career that i that felt so um like it's it, it, although the work and the things that we're, we're seeing are quite terrifying like it feels good it's feel good work one of the things I did in um, the uh, postgrad thing, uh, part of it was linked to the Eden Project in the UK. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's like it was absolutely gorgeous. It used to be a, um, a mine and just completely transformed into this lush, biodiverse space where people can learn about 
ecology. So part of my, um, I had residentials there, which was really, really good for kind of deep transition, personal transition. And one of the things they did there, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, I just know it, is a <laughs> Japanese concept called Ikigai. Ikigai, um, yeah. Yeah. And so the Eden Project is an ARUP uh, big project that they did. It's one of the biggest sustainability regeneration projects mm. taking, a, a, was it an old mine or a super site fund uh, before? And then they totally converted us. One of the, the pinnacle projects in the world so far. So, yeah, it's absolutely. Um like world leading, if you like pioneering, if you think about it, that with the kind of question about what do you do when it stops, something stops being an extractive uh, practice and in industry, and how can you keep, how can you revive that space for the community and restore the land? So it's, it is absolutely, it was a privilege. Um, but yeah, one of the things was about like finding your reason for being. Um, and I seem to have found it through this. So to your question, this, this although it's hard, and it is hard and I don't know, we don't have all the answers and we don't, um, you know, there's difficult decisions to be made. It doesn't feel like work because it feels, it feels like a necessity and it feels like part of who I am um, now. <laughs> but very, very different to who I was back, you know, back six, seven years ago. What do, what do you do for organizations or people? What, if somebody approaches you and says, boy, we need some help, what what do you say? We do this, but we don't do that. Or do you say we're kind of the, we do everything organization? Tell us more specifically what, maybe what you've done for Extinction Rebellion, what you've done for others, uh, organizations you've helped and, and you know, yeah. what, what's a simple, take us on a walkthrough of what, what that process <laughs> is like. Uh, yeah, the first thing to say is it's constantly evolving, like we're learning, we're, we're really kind of committed to cyclical learning, so what's working, what's not working, what's needed, how are we doing, you know, how are we delivering. Um, we've landed in this really gorgeous space a year on where we, we exist to support emerging movements, working for systemic change in, in amidst the climate and ecological emergency. Um, and within that, we very much consider climate justice. Uh, you know, in, in that conversation and in, in those, within those issues. Um, and we support those movements with um, four services. Um, we offer infrastructure support. So whether that's kind of small groups that need support uh, setting up a legal entity, <coughs> excuse me, and, uh, you know, constituting and registering themselves as a, an organization, or they might actually decide that's not the route for them and they could use our fiscal hosting services so we can support them internally within Climate 2025. Um, so that's infrastructure. We offer an access to funding program. Um, one of the things, so taking our learnings from Extinction Rebellion and, and seeing how, seeing the challenges um, of getting funding from A to B uh, into social movements, we've kind of got that experience now and we've got some really strong relationships with uh, philanthropists and funders who are, who are starting so they can see the value of social movements and they're starting to um, seek advice on changing their strategies on how best to fund um, change makers so that's a really exciting journey it almost feels like matchmaking between someone with the resources and someone that needs them um, and also taking those yeah those philanthropists and foundations and things on that journey to really um, change the way, change the funding environment entirely. Um, so that's really exciting. We also offer consulting services. Um, and we're finding actually more increasingly within movements, things like uh, decision making structures and the actual internal structure of organizations can, can be tricky. So that we have someone that just absolutely loves helping people figure out the best structure to, um, you know, get them just doing the thing that they're good at. Um, and things like strategy, theory of change, communications, launching. Things. So we, we have like a roster of consultants that um, basically can support movements so just to free them up to, to do the thing that they want to do and, and bring in that, that skill set if they're missing it. Um, and then lastly is the kind of partnerships ecosystem space, which is um, me. This is the bit that I love. <laughs> uh, and it's essentially, I guess, understanding what's going on in the wider ecosystem. Um, seeing where there's kind of points of alignment, scope for collaboration. Um, it's my belief that for too long, it's, it's, it's things are in silo. And actually, if you come together, you know, there's limited resources and limited time. So actually, if, if you can bring groups of people together on specific issues or a specific sector, um, 
you can spread you know spread the task gap between you and achieve more and uh, uh, faster as a result of that so that's what really excites me is finding um groups and trying to support them in coming together and working together um so that's the four services and we do that on a, a pay as you feel model which is um is quite quite new and out there i guess um so we we understand that actually a lot of movements they can be really um like young at the, at the beginning of their journey and not actually have any funding and so we want to be able to support change makers regardless of we don't want wealth to be a barrier um so and, and we also work with people that do have um finances to be able to to um contribute i guess to the to the movement to the ngo that we're the not profit that we're doing and so it feels fair that you know we can support anyone regardless of um where they're at uh and we're we we're kind of sustained with a mixture of of that pay as you feel for the clients that can can support us and then with um foundation money from foundation to keep us going um and what's really interesting is is we started with a kind of ordinary or typical structure so registered as a not-for-profit in the uk um a company limited by guarantee um and we're going through our own internal review to try and make something more horizontal, so like a workers cooperative, so that there's a less traditional hierarchy of directors and, and employees and things. Um, yeah, so we're kind of in the middle of that and hope to come out of that in, in May with, a, with the best way forward and everyone in the team's inputting into that. Um, we're I think we're just trying to be the change that we want to see in the world. We don't always get it right and there's a lot of unknowns. We're not following a clear path, we're making our own. So we're learning from mistakes continuously, um, but it seems to be working. We have about 68, coming up to 70 movements that we support at the moment um, on our kind of on our books, for want of a better word, in our portfolio. And um, they, they, they range from just all manner of different groups and things across different sectors, different size, scale, like their approach of how they're creating change. Um, it feels it feels nice that we've tapped into something we're kind of trusted entity that emerging movements can tap into and get the support that they need um yeah it's a, it's a joy that's beautiful that's really beautiful thanks for kind of letting us know on on all all the pillars of what you do and and what that process uh looks like um in the show notes and descriptions i'm gonna definitely list your website and all your your links on how people can reach out to you there's a lot of people who uh, either belong to a movement or want to start their own movement. There's a lot of emergence right now for indigenous movements um, where they're uh, cooperating and, and coming together. And uh, there's <clears throat> a lot of farmer movements as well right now. So there's just uh, always a need for that support um, because Normally, as an activist or somebody who goes out as um, even an environmentalist or to, to be part of a movement or start a movement, there's not all the the skills and structure of of how do you make that organization work? How do you avoid um, discontent or fighting within the organization? How do you align the mission, the why, the purpose, the you know, and obviously the funding, how do you make the whole thing work? And, and um, what one thing I really liked with uh, Extinction Rebellion that came out early on was that regenerative cultures. Well, what what does that mean? What does that really, how, how do you understand that? And the, uh, our world is, is growing around us exponentially so good bad and ugly <laughs> exponential growth and and, and problems um, how do we keep up to pace up to speed with that and really the the key is in that um evolutionary culture that regenerative culture the fastest way for humanity to 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 grow and evolve is through regenerative culture. Well, culture uh, still takes a long time to develop and, and evolve, but it's a lot faster than traditional evolution and traditional forms of growth and, and, and that. And it's one that uses the exponential function. It's one that uses this, this uh, community culture and, and, and something. So I really like that uh, 
re uh, Extinction Rebellion use that regenerative cultures because that's one of the, the ways that I always say is that it's the quickest way humanity can kind of come together and hit a critical mass and mass and, and uh, evolve much faster than traditionally we've evolved over the years. I think in some industries, in some ways, we're still stuck in in the dark ages, you know, with the ways we do things and interact with our planet. But the more we come together and the more we have that culture and that community as global citizens, as a, this part of a symbiotic earth and understand systems, the more quickly we can impact our, our, our planet positively. So I really like that. I don't know if you are involved in, in, in that at all, but I know that's kind of what I heard out of what you said, what you help organizations kind of find their purpose, but also help them with the tools that they need to get that, keep it and keep that momentum going. Yeah. Um, so for me, that was a really, that was, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, that was one of the things that resonated really strongly with me. It was a new term for me, like regenerative culture. And sometimes I still think maybe it's really, it's really hard to know what it is or how to describe it. And if you haven't come across the phrase before, it can be a bit uh, just, you know, what on earth does, <laughs> does this mean? Um, but for me, like when you look at the, the challenges that we've got coming forward, when you're looking at, um, you know, increasing drought, floods, conflict, and things, the very kind of fabric of, of life, things like food, systems and food availability they're, they're going to start to become really scarce and as as beings sentient beings we have a choice either to kind of go down the route of like individualist and like you know hoarding and and you know not sharing and hatred and uh, division or we can be compassionate and and come together and support one another through these challenges ahead. And so for me, regenerative culture is just shifting everything, every aspect of what we do to that kindness, compassionate route. And so, um, you know, we do it within uh, Climate 2025, trying to, um, <laughs> it's even small things like regenerative scheduling of our calendars, making sure that we're not putting too much, you know, back-to-back -back meetings which is so easy to do in in um zoom pandemic times um and and also it's, it's like making sure that there's space for mental health in your working week i don't know about you but if i'm having a day when i'm when i'm just not in the zone or you know i feel sad about something or like a bit of news or something has just triggered something and my focus isn't there it's almost it just it seems to me like a waste to try and try and work through it when your mind's not in there. Whereas the, the flip side of that, I know that when I am in the zone, my goodness, I can go like 12 hours straight. And my husband has to come in with, <laughs> with food. So it's like um, sort of sharing that across the team and knowing that people have space to be human and, and trying to um, just create a working culture, I guess, that's, that's just caring and reflective of actually our individual needs. Um, yeah, it's 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 really special. It's a it's a really wonderful wonderful thing, and I think we're seeing more and more of this um, regenerative learning and sharing. And what's really interesting is when it starts to become a habit, and you do you kind of think about these things in every day, it kind of ekes into other areas. So like, I'd start to have kind of more authentic conversations with with people outside my work circle, people that hadn't encountered regenerative culture and and it's just it creates space for kind of just doing things slightly differently um asking different questions when you meet up with people and yeah just trying to find trying to, trying to connect to one another that little bit better than we have been doing <laughs> so i'm gonna i'm gonna call you on the carpet a little bit and put you on the spot i, I think you'll do just fine but basically <laughs> yeah, so not only from extinction rebellion but also from the al gore climate reality training you receive and also from your degree you received uh some tools uh, specifically from al gore's climate reality training you received a little a usb stick with all al gore's climate presentations in on on that stick as well as access to an online portal or the reality hub where you could go 
and access new updated materials, access to a network and, and kind of a system on the back end that was, was kind of almost like a social network in and of itself that gives you access to the latest materials, presentations, data, science, but also that network of people in different places and parts of the world or even in parts of the United Kingdom that are already leaders that you guys could collaborate and work together. Um, and, and the climate reality leadership, they call it um, acts, uh, acts of leadership. And uh, so I wanna ask you one, how after your training, have you used and applied those tools? Um, did they make a change in, in your life? And how, how do you depart not just those presentations, but also that wisdom and knowledge on to others. And I want to caveat it just a little bit because um, I always thought that it's unbelievable that Al Gore says, you know, here's my presentation. I'm going to give it to you. You can put in slides, take out slides. You can make it your own. I empower you to give this presentation. Um, here's the basics of it, but you don't need to word for word give it like I do. I've given it to you and I'm empowering you to make what you want out of it. And, and so I kind of want to get an update on how you've used those tools, how they've helped, did they help? What would you like to see differently? And, and, and give us a little more insight into that experience or that journey. <clears throat> I'm going to be super honest with you here. Um, I have learned about myself that I am terrible at giving presentations. Absolutely terrible. I can speak one on one, which is <laughs> why I'm con completely content, like having this conversation with you. I feel completely relaxed, you know, in my Zen, but um, put two or three or four more people that, that I'm speaking with and I crumble, um, get shaky and my voice just quivers. And um, so I, and I think the other thing was, I was so desperate to convince people like, like, please look at this. This is real. You know, like that intensity. So not, not being good at, at being a natural kind of presenter and the intensity of almost demanding the people that hear this change. Like they just, it just didn't work for me. I remember trying it out on my family and it just, it just causing like tension and, oh, yeah, I think I discovered very early on that my place in this wasn't giving the, the presentations. Um, and almost, I, I guess I've almost come to sort of serve and platform the people that can do that. Like, I think what's really nice to learn is that um, there are multiple ways of creating change. Um, and there are various different tools and things out there to fit every personality. Um, you know, you have amazing groups who, who look at the climate psychology um, in, in kind of conversations and how you how best to describe what's going on in a way that people can relate. You know, there's experts in that and I'm not an expert in that. Um, and you have people that are really natural, you know, on a stage and things um, and, and they should be given the space to do so. But I think for me, uh, it was quite empowering to acknowledge that that wasn't my space. And I'm continually trying to find what is my space and support those who can, you know, be the front person and who can uh, give a presentation and change hearts and minds because that's kind of what it's about. I was I was terrible at it, Mark. <laughs> well, I appreciate you being so honest because that's actually um, the the right answer. So, not not everybody's a, a good presenter. Not everybody wants to give presentations. Um, honestly, probably less than 1% of people who go to a, a training like that actually become active and start giving presentations, but much more, a much larger percentage go back and they change their social media. They change their, um, way they write, if they write articles or if they publish something yeah. in the local press or they join movements or projects that have to do with sustainability, or they even just change their own life, uh, their own house, their own household, their own lifestyle to kind of reflect that. And then after they feel that they have a good grasp on that, and they have the tools already to kind of spread it out and, and support uh, 
to support others. And there is, it's not just all about presentations. So there's so many different aspects that, that you can go, uh, directions that you can go in to actually raise the awareness to do acts of leadership that aren't mm -hmm. necessarily presentations where you can speak to politicians, government leaders, uh, ministers, mm -hmm. but also where you can speak to community leaders. So yeah. uh, church groups and, and um, activity groups and sport groups and universities um, on small levels or on a big level, so, or you just uh, take a supportive role. So I think that's great. And then the, the other aspect that they really offer is that back end kind of a network of a, a of a extended family almost of of tools um, people you can connect with who who probably are better versed or more experienced or can help and support to, 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 so it's a nice organization to already have a, a, a people of, of the like mind willing to help that are also connected to other networks i really like that i think you've tapped the nail on the head there is that actually the the, the sort of the, the front end, the public facing piece, of, this is probably true of most movements, is the smallest part of the iceberg. There's so much going on behind the scenes. There's so much going on at a local level. There's so much um, kind of almost administration work going on everywhere. So the, the front piece is, is often maybe the smallest piece. It's very, very important, um, but there's so much going on behind the scenes. And I think, um, I think within these kind of social movements um, and, and change making organizations, it's really, really great that people can find a piece that's right for them. Um, you know, we see it in, um, in Fridays for Future, we see it in Extinction Rebellion, we see it in all of the different movements. And I haven't touched on the, the other ones that we're, we're involved with in supporting, but you'll have those kind of front faces who are really good at what they do. But you'll have the, the data analysts, you'll have the, um, like the organizers and <laughs> like strategists and you know, all of that stuff is so important um and i think it's it's nice to give yourself self space and time to find find what fits you you know there is this rush we're under this time pressure but you you're only gonna uh, to, to kind of uh, take a turn from lara uh, uh lara steen is the superpower the superpower I, i've so taken the order and adopted that as my word and i'm constantly going you know like let, let's what what is our superpower what's your superpower how can we find it how can you be the best version of you and contribute the most to this um to this problem so yeah taking time and figuring out your superpower i think is really valuable that's amazing so um I want to, I still want, I'm not letting you off the hook yet because I want to go deeper, um, even though, because there's a transformation and it happens with a lot of people. And, and I want to kind of bring that, that story out a little bit more because there's many people in your same situation or many people in, in wanting to, to join a movement. And then there's some who are just at a, at a much different level. They're so worried about the basic needs of life that they can't even think about the environment or, or, or ecology. They're so worried about just making ends meet or, or getting through the day um, that they don't even think on that level. And that's where we need a, no, a whole nother support infrastructure of people who can kind of help help uh, uh, move things forward and take them from that, that place where they're at to an, a different level on, on a different journey of empowerment and, and uh, to, to receive the basics that they have. Kind of where I want to go with this is the, the fact that I, what I see or hear and what we've talked before, it's almost like there was a light that went on something in the tools, something that, that you heard, you weren't struck by a lightning, you weren't a climate refugee, but something changed in your life where you're like, oh my gosh, there's, there, there's, uh, why aren't we paying attention? You know, kind of like Greta Thunberg says, you know, that the, our planet's burning, our house is on fire. You know, why aren't we doing something? Um, what was that like for you and what did, what did that look like and why can you not go back and what, what's kind of continuing to drive you mm. uh, forward every day? There's so many pieces of that and there's so many ways I could answer that. Um, so firstly, for me, I just want to acknowledge that, that there, there is, a, there is a, a narrative here around privilege. And for me, it, 
for me, you doing what you can, if you're in a position of privilege, like it's you're either part of the solution or continuing the status quo is, is part of the problem. So if you know, I'm I'm really lucky to have been able to go and do this postgrad and and do the things that I'm doing. And so for me, it's um it feels like an obligation a being part of our collective human family. Um then the other piece for me is um I wanted to talk about um mass participation of this transition and, and getting you know moving towards more democracy not less um for me we need all of that all of those range of voices in coming up with the solutions um a really gorgeous project that uh, we all start to see emerge later this year is a, the idea of a global citizens assembly and to try and get representatives of our global human family all um, receiving this knowledge and in, in, in very unique situations, but then coming to a, a kind of just and fair transition that doesn't leave people behind, that, you know, that people who, that anyone can be a part of basically. So that feels really important to me. Um, and the bit about, the bit about like going back, it's, oh, it's so strange. I, for me, it was that that documentary before the flood, and it just just hurt and landed and wouldn't go away. It's like you know, like a shadow or another limb or something. Like <laughs> it just wouldn't go away. And there, you know, on my lowest days, I sometimes catch myself thinking, "I wish I didn't know. I wish I wish I didn't know this, and I could just be blissfully ignorant." But that is such a, a a moment, a thought, a moment that goes in and out so quickly because it's just not an option. Um, yeah, I, and for me, it's like that's that that's the um, the magic is like if we can find out what activates people in the same way that it did to me. And I don't know that you know everyone has their own journey to this. Um, and you also might have a you know a range of people that get it but they just don't know what to do there's so so much kind of conflicting information out there um and then you have to throw throw that in with like the false news and um and the just destructive kind of misinformation putting out there by like fossil fossil fuel conglomerates and things like that it's really confusing so i imagine there's a huge cluster of people who want to do something but just don't know what that something is yeah i it's a really good question and I, just, and, and I don't know what the answer is. You know, there's a, um, we're working with, uh, I don't know if you know, Frederick Lelou, he uh, wrote a book, um, Reinventing, oh, Reinventing Organizations. Organizations. Yeah, I'm actually in the book, so. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Oh my goodness. So we, um, I met Frederick, um, oh gosh, maybe um, 18 months ago through Extinction Rebellion. Um, and he's got a new project that's emerging um, and it's, it's, it's looking at that site, a, like psychology piece like what does it take to get somebody to receive the information feel the information and feel like something changed within them like in your physiology um so that you can't look away and so yeah i don't i don't know how much i can share about it but it, it looks really really great really exciting and to create almost like a trend out of out of giving this your attention and out of giving this your time like this is this is worthy of us all to, to pay attention to. Um, that's a really interesting uh, project that he's working on. And for me, that's like, yeah, that's how, how to get people to care about this. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, uh, Frederick, Frederick, Frederick Laloux has been, been around for a while. So there's some really greats that, uh, that I love around the future of work, the way we look at the uh, uh, at work and, and uh, organizations and in many different structures. And he's truly a, a thought leader in many, many, many respects. And so, um, but yeah, I'm actually listed in his book. Uh, it's hard to see, but right there, <laughs> oh, yeah. somewhere right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> but, but yeah, he's, He's um he's a wonderful guy. And so yeah, there's there's so many thought leaders in, here in Germany. We have another thought leader that actually was in living in the US for a while, but he's German as Tim Leberich. He started the 
business romantic society he wrote the books the business romantic and uh the romantic societies and the be beautiful house of beautiful business and things like that and and frederick lalu and and um you know the teal organizations and things that are such wonderful thought processes you touched on um kind of this global citizen topic and and I, I maybe want to go a little bit deeper there so i want to ask you a question do you believe that you're a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without borders divisions of humanity one from another so these these boundaries that uh, uh, not just in lockdown that kind of restrict humanity one from another, you know, the removal of borders, nations and divisions of humanity. And where do you see any trends or what's your feeling about this type of a movement or thought philosophy? Um, yeah, so I very much consider myself a global citizen. Um, and a European to that to that note as well. I did my very best to uh, to campaign for remain in, in the Brexit era. Um, for me, that very uh, concept of global citizenship is under threat at the moment. Um, we're seeing rise of kind of nationalism and borders and division, and it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. Um, I think part of being a global citizen is understanding the interconnectedness of us all. Like as, as a species, we're actually deeply embedded in ecology, you know, in ecology. We're not um, separate from it. And so when you start to think actually the air that I'm breathing today could have, <laughs> you know, could have come from the, the air that you're breathing over there. And like it's, it, you can't, nature hasn't got boundaries and borders. It's only human social structures that have been put there. Um, and uh, yeah, and I guess for me, that's, it's just, it's under threat. And I think this is why it's really important. And we're starting to see this like youth uprising, being more engaged in politics, understanding it, how, you know, the structures that exist and, and what the other alternatives are out there, you know? Um, it's um, fascinating and terrifying in equal doses, but anything that can move us to shared a shared existence is positive in my opinion. Yeah. What yeah, about you? You said that so nicely. It's, it's absolutely true. We're all breathing the same air. We're all drinking the same water. We're all, um, I mean, qu how quickly the pandemic spread. Uh, it's a, it's a microscopic, uh, um, bacteria or virus that um, uh, spread throughout our whole planet that's affected the whole world. It's smaller than a, a grain of dust. It's smaller than a, a strand of hair. Mm -hmm. And yet it affected our whole planet. We're breathing the same water or breathing the same air that Gandhi breathed, that uh, Plato, Socrates, that uh, you know Julius Caesar, whoever you look at in history, uh, uh, breathed and drinking the same waters. It's all on this planet. It's all re regenerated, regurgitated, repurposed and recycled. Uh, and it, it remains here uh, in one form or the other. And it's not getting cleaner, let's put it that way. So one, one thing that most people don't understand is um, the reason we need to live a circular economy in a closed loop system is because that's how we've always lived. We're on the same spaceship Earth and that when we throw something away, there is no way it all remains here and it doesn't doesn't vanish. And if people stop their polluting or stop their fossil fuel usage, that pollution still here it just doesn't disappear. The Earth doesn't say, oh, they stopped. We're OK now. Poof, it's all gone. Uh, it remains here until somebody figures out an innovation or a solution to clean it up, to repurpose it so that it doesn't damage us, so that it doesn't hurt us. And, and that's really this uh, uh, one planet living. It's a planetary boundaries type of a living within the safe operating spaces of the resources and, and, and of our planetary boundaries as well. So what scares it's me, a, Mark, I was just going to say, it's like this... Uh, I, I know like progression, you know, when you think of like space and, and things like that, where you're talking about the one planet spaceship and everything exists on there. 
it terrifies me the amount of um, I saw an article the other day about the amount of litter that's just circ orbiting Earth and like prevent it like it could be at risk of damaging our uh, satellites and things and just and then when you think about the this determination to go to Mars and find the resources there like it just feels like we're missing the point <laughs> you know what are we just going to do just kind of expand and then mess up another area and expand and mess up another area it's like no get your get your house in order <laughs> first of all um yeah i'm with you there it's uh the circularity um we, we have much to learn from indigenous wisdom and indigenous knowledge um one of the most gorgeous books i've just been reading um is braiding sweetgrass um by robin uh yeah her surname evades me right now but it, it's just living more holistically with the land um and you mentioned it earlier about regenerative agriculture and how actually we're, we're stewards of the land we don't own own it you know we're stewards and and it it has a, a future and a life beyond us um and we can be in it as a species or not <laughs> you know it's um yeah for me it's, yeah. it's really black there's and white. some there's some light switches or some understanding of collective intelligence of humanity that for for some of us hasn't gone been turned on yet we're still not understanding our our integral tie to our earth we're not in, in understanding our integral tie to one another and how um there's no way that you know we should be fighting against each other because we're all homo homo sapiens we're all on the same spaceship earth and and um that that we've we've gone wrong in some respects that we're dealing with some of these issues there there was um 2018 was really a pinnacle year in, in many respects it's it's the year that all international organizations switch from a linear siloed approach to solving our global grand challenges to um, a systems approach of life a systems view of life to solve our global grand challenges and addressing all the facets of complex problems and, and complexity science to really uh, uh, stop uh, human suffering human health issues and and fix our global grand challenges but 2018 was also the time when you got your training and and many things were kind of starting to bubble to the surface and change and and you know the world couldn't but harvard came out with a study then and it, it was actually there's many studies that have been been done um, around the world and we've been talking about it since the 70s but um, that fossil fuel burning is responsible for one in five early deaths worldwide this was wow. in 2018 by by harvard um, health review the school of public health of harvard and and um you know, think about that. You just need to wrap your mind around that. One in five early deaths worldwide. We're talking billions of people mm -hmm. um, uh, to to hundreds of millions of people every single year. Cancer, heart attack, asthma, dementia, different particles in our air because our air is not going anywhere. Mm, it's yeah. it, it, what, whatever air we pollute or whatever goes into our atmosphere, it's not disappearing immediately. You know, we might not be able to see it right away, but it remains here. And so it is really a, a, a big and, and can be a scary thing in, in our world to see that. For but me, we need, like what, we need to was, realize that. Yeah, I was going to say for me that um, what, what scares me is the reliance on technology that maybe isn't quite there yet. And so there's this kind of rose tinted vision of the future where we've got carbon sequestration down, where we've got um, hydrogen, you know, um, all, all of these things that require tech advancements in tech. And some of them, some of it's there and some of it's not. Um, for me, like solar is there wherever, you know, <laughs> wind is there. It, it happens whether whether you capture it or not. Tidal is there, like e even geothermal is is available there it's not owned by anybody um i'm really concerned by the um the advancements and the kind of assumption that 
we can switch to things like hydrogen and that will be the solution for me this you still have to create that right someone still owns that so then there's still this profit piece of this and also the transport from like a a to b so the the resources being used to to create this uh product and then yeah it just it makes no sense to me my husband so we we're having this chat this morning and my husband's like I, you just got to wonder in those boardrooms of the the people you know who are still hell bent on the fossil fuel uh, journey and, and progressing with that. You've just got to wonder they, if they sit around in the boardrooms and like someone in the back of their mind thinking mm, we really should stop. Like we've really got to do something different, or you just can't imagine what goes on to to continue plundering the the planet and, and causing death the, the statistics you've just shared like what kind of humor does it take to not not be compassionate and care and want to change it, it, it really is terrifying and for me um there's another group um called truth teller life truth teller dot life i think it is um and we've only just started kind of helping them but it's about um really changing the culture on whistleblowing which feels really important because if you know out on the street if we see something wrong with someone doing something wrong we, we feel obligated to stop and change things or you know in our homes or it it, it, it feels really strange that that doesn't exist in a work environment and so truth teller um have created a kind of platform and, and campaigns around making a whistleblowing like a a moral obligation much like if you saw abuse happening in the workplace like you'd report it. it 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 feels really strange for me that companies would want to keep their employees quiet if they saw wrongdoing like that's horrific in my mind i and we have this open kind of policy with our team it's like what are we doing wrong tell us and let's let's make it better um yeah for me there's there's too much kind of false um, stories, false articles created about this kind of technological hope that's coming, but actually fundamentally doesn't really change anything. It's just the products that are changing. <laughs> the structures are still there. The profit um, is still there. The hierarchies are still there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I want to ask you the two hardest questions that I have for you um, today, really. The first one is uh, one, I, I'm a sustainable development goal advocate. I believe that there is only one global moonshot or plan for the future, and that's the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals was to, came up with in 2015. And it's a clear roadmap of targets and indicators from where we're going to go and need to go and uh, to reach a better future by 2030. I definitely am in alignment with you that we need to do it sooner than later or say are we going to make it it would be better to double down and, and make sure we're on that exponential path and, and actually try to achieve it beforehand um there's a lot of controversy a lot of things around that do you feel that the paris agreement the sustainable development goals is a good roadmap a plan to get us to uh, a better sustainable future how do you feel about that and are are there any other plans or global plans out there? Um, the EU has the, the New Green Deal. Um, then there's donut economics. There's planetary boundaries. There's a few others out there, but um, they're more regionally like the EU. They're more or the UK and different areas for, for certain things. What 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 what's your thoughts or opinions on on what's the, what's the plan? What's what's the goals? We're, we're, how what's are we going to get there? Um, so for me, firstly, wow, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, like it's credit where credit is due. I can I can imagine all of the people who, um, you know, started working at the UN because they wanted to bring change and the amount of effort and, you know, jostling to get th this you know, this statement in the, the Paris Agreement or, or not, you know, like credit where credit is due, that must have been hard work. And what's absolutely gorgeous about them is that it includes things like gender. It includes things like uh, life on land, so other species, you know, it's, it's really, it's a roadmap that is broad and includes so many um, elements that, that sometimes get neglected when we're talking about climate. So that, that's just incredible. For me, the most exciting one is that um, 
SDG 17 is the kind of partnerships coming together for change. Um, and for me, that's the space where there's the most opportunity, I think. Um, and we actually used uh, another one that you mentioned there, the Kate Woolworth Donut Economics. Um, we're developing a um, charitable element to Climate 2025. Keep a lookout for it. It's uh, the Movements Trust. <laughs> it's just going through the Charities Commission in the UK at the moment. Um, and we're using that structure to frame the work that that charity can do, because again, it's got the ecological barriers that can't be broken. Um, and there's also that, um, you know, social foundations that that shouldn't be broken either. So I, I absolutely love frameworks that include other elements other than just climate or the environment. Um, I think another really exciting thing is seeing what's possible beyond that. So again, I mentioned the, the kind of global citizens assembly and participatory democracy. Like I think it's it would be naive to kind of continue to assume that the structures that we currently have are the only ones that can, <laughs> that can be useful. It's like, it's it, sh it should be collaborative, not competitive. So I think like there, there's research going on across the world about, you know, global governance and, and what it could look like. And, and for me, the more citizens are engaged in, in helping shape policies and shape the direction that we're going in, in the better. Um, I just think anyone working on this, just, yeah, deep awe and gratitude for the amount of time and hours it must have taken. Um, I, had it, yeah. I had Alex Barker on the podcast a while back, and she co-authored with Sam Conniff the book, How to Be More Pirate. So the second version of Being More Pirate, and they spoke a lot about that people's assembly and the different democracy uh, options that there are, especially in the United Kingdom, what's what's going on. So I love that. Um, the The hardest question I have for you today is really uh, the burning question, WTF. And it's not the swear word that we've all been asking each other, you know, although I'm sure sure we've been frustrated in saying saying that as well. It's actually, what's the future? Mm -hmm. And so I want, want to know, so I'm being very leading and I'm trying to get out. So we talked about what's the global goal or the plan, the action plan, the roadmap, the navigation of where we're going to go for the future. You, you like the sustainable development goals, you like the donut economics and that, but now I'm asking you the burning question, WTF, what's the future? Mm. I think... Um... What I probably should have said in the the question before is the limitations of um, these frameworks. You know that they do look for these uh, um, dates far in the future, and, and we do need to change now. Um, but for me, what's really exciting is the change that's happening, irrespective of the structures that that are already there. So. Um, to take, for example, um, we've spoke, spoken quite a lot about Extinction Rebellion, but to take to take that, for example, one of the almost byproducts, if you will, of this movement is that it's creating um, communities, connected communities on the ground. And so it's, it's what it's leaving behind is almost like a legacy of um, citizens on a local level who understand this crisis they've found each other they're creating little pockets of like community orchards and um like lobbying things for their local governments so on the one hand um the future for me is is really really micro and it's like how do we make sure that food gets it stays in that same place how do we make sure that um, economies whatever they might be stay and benefit those local communities and then the other level is this massive kind of macro level i guess is that we need to care about those communities on the other side of the planet. You know, it's we are deeply connected. And for me, um, the future is, I guess, radical compassion um, and, and radical collaboration and connectivity. Um, we, we can't, we don't know what, what's gonna come. I mean, we, we can see the science and see that it's gonna get worse before it gets better, if it gets better. <laughs> Um, and so for me, the only future that would be that I'd consider a success would be one where we're working together for the better betterment of everybody, people, planet, 
um, and every every living being on it um, and doing so at both that kind of you know neighborly level local level but also that uh, compassion and, and awareness and knowledge of what's going on everywhere else in the world and and taking taking that as something you should care about rather than oh somebody else can deal with that like that's not happening here so I don't need to care about that um yeah that for me does that answer your question that's quite a big question <laughs> yeah absolutely you got it right you actually got it right because Yay! there is no right answer all, all the answers are right I, I've asked them many times and every answer is different so but but it's it's important to be thinking about that because it really ties to whether we're going to make that future. If you know what it is, if you've thought about it, if you've got some kind of a plan, then you're definitely going to get there. But if it's kind of wishy washy and unsure, mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm pretty positive you're not going to get there because it just it life doesn't happen and work that way. What will happen right. is someone else or some other generation or some other culture community will deliver that future for you some government or yeah a there's, um, will deliver it. do you know on that note there's something there's a really gorgeous thing that um we've been working on called benchmark for nature um and and exactly what you're saying there is either you grasp the future and take the right direction or you leave it and somebody else will fill that um it's a collaboration between oxford university um some people in the investment space like um I've been working in finance for a long time and with this um new kind of trend of the disclosures investment disclosures and things there's a, a very real need to have the data and have the metrics to be able to report on investment and finance that's so much power in finance to achieve this transition um, and this group are working from a science um science base to kind of figure out what a metric system might look like and they're doing this way before i think the when the um regulations change in um europe is uh january 2022 so they're doing this like they've got this foresight and starting all of that has been going for a year now these researchers figuring out the best way the best metric system to help uh investors and people with wealth to care about to be able to make informed decisions about where they're putting their money um and and, if, and and they say regularly say that if they didn't do that, something else would come forward that's less valid, you know, and less rooted in science and data. Um, and then you risk greenwashing, which actually doesn't achieve anything. So I'm with you there. You you can either be part of the change, or if you know if you're passive, and uh, you know there's that sort of state of apathy, then it's going to happen whether you like it or not. And <laughs> so I guess you can't really complain at a later date if you haven't been part of the, the journey you can't really complain about the outcome later on right <laughs> I'm with you there. so you in the beginning we spoke about your kids and you mentioned that kind of a big part of this journey or you getting uh, passionate about it was your concern about the future of your children um the last hardest question I have for you in that respect is basically what kind of legacy are, are you are you creating now to leave for your children or as a, a ancestor of the future in the year 2100 what kind of legacy do you want to leave the planet for that time i can see this um there, there being sort of two answers to this and one of them's the kind of um ideological <laughs> legacy um that's like you know yeah they'll see me trying to like badly grow my own veg and things and have those skills to be able to grow their own food they'll see we, we're lucky enough to have um some ex-battery chickens um and so you know seeing them care for animals and and seeing the benefit from them so there's, there's this kind of dream state that i want them to be able to have those skills to be able to uh, function in a society that will be very different from now but then I, I have to just I, I feel like I'll be doing a disservice to um, parents everywhere if I didn't acknowledge how hard this co this pandemic has been my kids spend far too long on the computer gaming with their friends <laughs> like I, 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 I'm, I work full-time my husband works full-time and as much as you want to be the best the best you can be as a parent is they're their own people like right now, my uh, we've got issues of um, 
uh, like understanding themselves and um, and love the concept of love and sexuality and things like those are real issues concerning them. So my part is is in helping them be who they want to be, and it might not be this eco um, eco able and <laughs> like connected to plants, and it might not be that they might be advocates for something else. I think um, what I, I really hope is that that I've created space for them to be themselves um, and to ask questions, constantly ask questions. Um, and, and to kind of find the, find the people, find your tribe, you know, find the people that make you feel good about yourself and that you feel good about them. Um, we've had like instances of bullying and things like this. It's just, it, it's, it's such a difficult question to answer because their worlds are so very different. Um, than, than the one that I'm seeing. And of course they know what I do. They know, you know, I remember a couple of years ago when the report from the uh, United Nations came out with, we've, just, we've got 10 years, we've got to change before 2030. My God, that gave my son nightmares. Like, what do you mean we've only got 10 years? Like, are we all gonna die in 2030? Like, it's, <laughs> it's so hard to frame what we're doing in a way that fits um, their worlds right now. Um, and I, I don't know what the what the answer would be. Like I constantly make mistakes as a parent. I constantly want to have more time to be able to do more things with them. But like I, we used to have an allotment. It's like pulling teeth, trying to get them to go to the allotment and dig, <laughs> dig in the margin, you know, plant seeds and things. They just they just weren't interested and it made us all really unhappy. So uh, I don't think I the future that I see, I guess, is that they that they care, they're compassionate, that they're themselves, they know themselves and they feel able to be the best version of themselves. We don't know what the rest of the, you know, the rest of society is going to look like, but at least if they do that, then hopefully they can find companions and people to journey with them when the going gets tough and they have that solid foundation of who they are and the best kind of humans to be. Who knows? <laughs> My son might invent some sort of amazing computer game that somehow makes, <laughs> I don't know, yeah, makes a change, who knows? <laughs> there's a big trend in that. So there's a lot of gamification and yeah. uh, a AI going on in, in the climate space and, and direct air capture and many other things on how can you gamify people being active and, and uh, getting out and, and uh, contributing to the environment, to ecology, to raise awareness. So that's great. If there was one message you could depart to um, my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Mm. Oh, I feel like I'd be stealing Lara's, but it's, it's find your superpower. And I, and I honestly never used to be the sort of person to use words like that. Um, and probably there's still circles that I exist in where if I were to use those words, I'd be like, what, who have you become? Um, but oh my goodness, doesn't it feel good when you find yourself and find that you're able to make a difference and find joy from doing that, despite the kind of <laughs> the negative uh, information that we're working with here. Like, it's, it's just find yourself and be part of the change. There's space for everyone, right? And we need everyone. What should young innovators um, in your field, nonprofit, be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a real impact? <sighs> oh, there's so many ways. I can't stress enough how, um, how important it is right now to be politically active. Um, to understand the systems of oppression and the systems of patriarchy and just, yeah, it, it needs everybody to, um, to kind of understand that and know where they can make a difference. I don't know what it's like um, across the world, but in the UK, we didn't even learn about politics. They, like you could take it later, really later on and when you're about sort of 16 as, a, as something, an option to choose. But like that's a, that's a deep rooted um, skill to know how how laws are made and how to change that. So for me, that's incredibly important to anyone, any generation. Um, and and also, I think what I've learned is if if the 
if the thing doesn't exist yet and you can you have an idea or a, an initiative or something just create it um i've never never owned my own business before and this is this i guess is a not for profit slightly different than traditional corporates um but i never thought i could do this um you know but i found somebody who's supporting me and helping me grow um and the team's expanded and we we're creating something that we felt that there was a need for um, and it's been <laughs> it's been really well received externally, and we seem to be filling fulfilling that need. And there's a massive demand for what we're doing. And so for me, yeah, it's finding the courage to to create the the initiatives and the solutions that you, that you think are right. That's all I have for you today. And <laughs> if uh, there's something that you didn't get to get off your chest or discuss with us today, now is your chance to depart those words of wisdom. Otherwise, I'm done. And I, I thank you for being on the show. Oh, that's so very kind of you. Um, I think the last thing to do is just to like, to, to regeneratively check out of this meeting. And we do this for the moment meetings. We kind of check in as a human and I check out as a human. Um, and just to say that I'm feeling completely um, inspired and joyous, connecting to you, learning, <laughs> you know, learning where there's alignment and similarity in our work. Um, and so, yeah, I'm feeling really hopeful leaving this conversation and with, with deep gratitude to you for holding the space. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And it's been a sheer pleasure. And I hope to catch up with you again very soon and to see some uh, continuing beautiful uh, projects and missions and uh, uh, actions going on around the world that you have um, because uh, it's great work and I'm glad that we could connect and spend this time. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thanks, Mark. Have a good day. Bye.